we're happy to welcome you to ATLAS. ATLAS is a state-of-the-art accelerator to study the properties of atomic nuclei. And we want to know about atomic nuclei because, after all, it's nuclear physics, nuclear reactions that power the sun, that created all the elements in our body, the carbon, the oxygen that we're made of, were made somewhere in a star or a nuclear explosion. And we're trying to reproduce those features here in our accelerator. ATLAS is the world's first superconducting heavy ion linear accelerator. So it pioneered a technology that's now used throughout the world for accelerating nuclei. The reason we need the rare isotope accelerator is an accelerator like this can accelerate any stable beam. Any material you give me to put in our ion source, we can accelerate and make a beam of. Okay? That lets us study a certain range of nuclei. But what we find is, is that if we try to extend that knowledge to nuclei farther from the valley of stability, our different models give different pictures of what happened. The reason that's important is because actually the processes in stars that create the chemical elements, processes like the rapid neutron capture process, actually take place on these very unstable nuclei in, for example, supernova explosions. So if we want to understand a supernova explosion, we have to understand these nuclei very far from stability. So what do you need to do? Well, first, you need to produce the... Um, rare isotopes, the nuclei far from stability. And we only have two ways of doing that. It's really brute force. You can take a heavy target and take a, a, a beam of a light isotope like hydrogen, smash it into the target, that causes the target to break up, collect the fragments, and then you can use an accelerator like Atlas to re-accelerate it and do an experiment. The other way you make rare isotopes is you take a very heavy beam, like uranium, accelerate it. You basically throw it against a brick wall and shatter it, okay? And you again collect the fragments. That needs an accelerator that can very efficiently accelerate uranium. That's why it's different than the spallation neutron source, the advanced photon source, or an accelerator like Fermilab. With the superconducting LINAC, you can actually accelerate multiple charge states at the same time to the final energy. So that gives this class of accelerators a, almost an order of magnitude increase in efficiency over any other type of accelerator for, for accelerating these hard charge states of heavy ions. And that's why a superconducting LINAC was chosen for the rare isotope accelerator. So this is the heart of the superconducting uh, linear accelerator. This is a single uh, superconducting cavity. Uh, this concept was developed here at Argonne in the uh, mid-1970s. The beauty of these particular cavities is that first they can have a very high effective electric field generated because they're superconducting. And secondly, they're of a size so that they can accelerate a range of velocities. So to accelerate a particle from about 2% the speed of light up to 15% the speed of light, which is what we might want at the end of the experiment, we have 60 different uh, individual one of these cavities in three LINAC sections along the accelerator. Okay? And this has proved to be an incredibly powerful and flexible uh, concept, and it allows this accelerator to run greater than 95% operating efficiency. The ion that comes in gets accelerated, and then while it's in the center of this drift tube, you can change the polarity, okay? And so when it leaves the drift tube, it can continue to be accelerated, and you just continue through this. All of this, in this type of accelerator design is made out of niobium, and so this is all superconducting material. That means it has to be maintained at four degrees above absolute zero, and so, and so there's lots of very complicated subtleties into getting enough cooling into these drift tubes, for example. 
Okay, this is actually a very special opportunity because we have one of the cryostats uh, removed from the accelerator for maintenance. So each of these units here is an individual superconducting resonator cavity. And they are bundled into a single cryostat that holds six cavities. So right now, this last cavity has been taken off and in fact, they've been taken back upstairs to retreat the surfaces. What you can see is all the plumbing that it takes to go from that simple abstract geometrical structure you saw in the resonator to a real accelerator to make sure that you pump it out and maintain the vacuum, to cool it down to liquid helium temperatures to be able to tune the accelerator so that the frequency at which the, the cavity resonates is exactly the frequency you want. So this is where the physicists develop new classes of cavities as we're doing right now for the rare isotope accelerator. And so we have a prototype cavity which right now they're cooling down to do uh, performance testing for the rare isotope accelerator uh, concept. Okay, this is where the beam starts on its journey through the accelerator. This is the ion source. And so what we need to do to begin is we want to take whatever isotope we want to accelerate and we want to ionize it as much as possible. And that's done in this electron cyclotron resonance ion source where we form a plasma by putting in a lot of energy and then the collisions within that plasma strip off electrons, say a uh, oxygen nucleus, and so we can have very highly ionized oxygen, six plus or something like that, and that makes the acceleration process much efficient. This whole thing is done at a very high voltage. This whole cage maintains the source at about 220 kilovolts, and so that's what gives us the initial boost to accelerate it into the accelerator. We actually have two of these ion sources, one here, one on the other side of the room, that lets us set up one beam while we're delivering another beam, so that means we can change between two different ion species very quickly. Let's just deliver more beam to the users. And so we extract the beam from the end of the ion source, and it goes through the pipes over there is bent by a magnet, comes around this beam pipe, is bent by this magnet, and then injected into the linear accelerator. Of course, the beam always has to be in vacuum because if it was traveling through air, the, uh, it would immediately lose energy from ionization collisions in air. So everything has to happen inside a vacuum beam pipe. And a lot of what you see here is the pumps that's necessary to pump all the air out of the beam pipe to establish that vacuum. The linear accelerator starts in those massive shielding uh, about 15 meters down here. That's where the beam gets first injected into the linear accelerator. This is the primary electronics, okay, which provides the RF power for each of the accelerator, which provides the control to make sure the accelerator is exactly at the right frequency and it's exactly the right phase for, to accelerate the beam down the series of accelerators. This is the resonator control electronics that control the exact frequency of the phase of the cavity. This is a, a slow pressure tuner or we actually use gas pressure to more slowly vary the frequency of the cavity. And you have to, you have to use all these techniques because at uh, some very small level, all these cavities are vibrating, just from us jumping up and down and the vibrations of the earth and various motors and things like that. And these, frequent, these cavities are so sensitive that you have to correct for those vibrations. And so, a large part of the technology in a superconducting LINAC is developing the techniques to average over these vibrations and be able to consistently produce a beam. 
And that's what we've demonstrated we can do very well. It's part of the design for RIA, not only developing new accelerating cavities, but we're developing a new cryostat structure that will allow the cavities to perform better. And so the first test of this cryostat will be used to boost the energy of the Atlas facility. So Atlas will continue to grow, increase its capabilities, while being used again as a proving ground for the RIA technology. So one of the things that we've been working very hard is to make sure that when we develop a new technology, we involve local industry, we use their talents to improve the fabrication techniques, and then transfer, transfer that technology to industry. So for example, industries like Meyer Tool or Siaki are uh, now experts at various parts of the fabrication of these superconducting cavities. So this is the gamma sphere, which as I said, is the world's most powerful detector for nuclear gamma rays. The beam would be coming along this beam pipe and would hit a target inside that aluminum sphere. Once that reaction happens, it very often set the nucleus, the resulting nucleus spinning very fast. And I said, these are the fastest spinning objects we know about. They spin 100 million, million, million times a second. And the way they lose all that angular momentum is they emit gamma rays that carry it off. And so this might emit 30 or 40 gamma rays. And, and in order to characterize that nucleus, and how it loses that energy, we want to detect as many of these gamma rays as possible. So that's what Gamma Sphere was built for. It's over a hundred very high resolution gamma ray detectors segmented such that each one can, can detect a different one of those 30 or 40 gamma rays. And so when we measure a reaction in Gamma Sphere, you get a very complete picture of exactly what happened in this rotating nuclei. The target is inside this aluminum sphere. And each of these assemblies is one of the detectors surrounded by a shield, okay? And so these are germanium detectors which are run at liquid nitrogen temperatures. They're, those are the very high uh, resolution gamma ray detectors. This whole thing moves in and collapses around the target, okay, to give us 4 pi coverage of the target. Right now, they're setting up to do an experiment with a, so a fission source inside Gamma Sphere to learn new properties of the fission process. By detecting the gamma rays, we can find out exactly what isotopes the fission in nuclei decays into and measure all its possible different decay paths. So this tells us a lot about the process of fission. Not only that, but it looks cool. It looks sufficiently cool that Hollywood decided it was a great prop for a movie. So they built a complete scale replica of Gamma Sphere and that was one of the stars, at least we think it's one of the stars when we watched the movie, in the movie The Hulk. And in that movie, the Hulk picks up this styrofoam replica of Gamma Sphere and throws it against the wall and destroys it. Another technique uses a series of electric and magnetic field to separate out the rare nucleus that result, okay, and directly identify them. So one of, the re one of the types of research we use this fragment mass analyzer for is for study nuclei that are so far away from stability that they literally drip protons off. So that's called proton decay. To really do a sensitive identification, you can combine the power of gamma sphere with the power of the FMA. We do that by moving the entire gamma facility, gamma sphere facility to this point, okay, and now we can use the very sensitive detection of the recoil of the fragment mass analyzer with the complete detection of the gamma rays in gamma sphere 
and really get a complete picture of what happened in the nuclear reaction. So how would a researcher come to do an experiment at Alice? Well, when you get a good idea, the first thing you do is you submit a proposal to the scientific director of Atlas. He then asks a program advisory committee of experts from all over the world to evaluate the proposals and to give them advice on which ones have the biggest scientific payoff, which are the best experiments to do. Taking the advice of the program advisory committee, the uh, scientific director then approves an experiment. Once your experiment is approved, then the full apparatus at Atlas can kick into gear, and we do the best we can to make your experiment get the kind of scientific results that you designed it to do. The scientific community has been pushing for an accelerator like the rare isotopes accelerator for over 15 years. Demand for the isotopes for Rhea comes not just from the nuclear physicists who want to understand the structure of the nucleus or the astrophysicists who want to understand the stars burn. But in fact, radioactive isotopes are used throughout our culture. Every year, there's over 10 million uh, therapeutic treatments and 100 million tests using radioactive isotopes in medicine in this country. Argon brings a number of very powerful advantages to the rare isotope accelerator. Argon has a continuing reputation of operating major accelerator facilities, facilities like the ZGS, the Intense Pulse Neutron Source, and most recently the Advanced Photon Source, and indeed Atlas itself, very efficiently, very effectively, and very safely.